So, so uh, welcome. Um, I'm just in terms of full disclosure, I'm going to say almost nothing about cancer. So, if you came to this meeting to learn to learn something about cancer, you should. Um, you know, take this moment to, you know, go back in the other room, get a cup of coffee and relax. Um, what I've done for the last 20 years is build statistical models over big data. And, you know, as the amount of data um, grows in genomics, you know, it, it's perhaps interesting to think about, you know, how to best build statistical models over it. Um, but I'm not going to get to the cancer. and. I'm going to, and you know, if you want to sue me, you can, but I'm going to use the term big data for a little bit, um, just to refer to large amounts of data. So I'm going to talk about some of the problems we have with large data, how you might compute over it, um, one of the technologies, uh, science clouds that can be used for it, and then how we might organize at scale as the amount of genomic data grows. So the whole talk is organized around four questions, and I have no idea what the answers to these questions are. So if you have strong opinions, it would be interesting to talk about them through the meeting. So the, the, the first question is, what's the same and what is different about large biomedical data versus big science data versus commercial data? You'll hear my opinions, but I think it's going to take us a couple years to get to ground truth. The second question is, as the amount of genomics data grows, what's the right instrument to use? The third question is, as the amount of data grows, can we use the same statistical techniques we have been using or do we need to create new technologies? I think that's the toughest problem um, to think about. And the third is, how do we organize as a community as the amount of genomics data grows? And we wouldn't have to think through these questions if the uh, amount of uh, dollars we had was growing with the amount of data. Then we could sort of do what we're doing, and as long as both dollars and um, sort of our ability to, uh, to sort of do smart things with data grew as fast as Moore's law, then we wouldn't have a problem. But more or less, there's a constant amount of dollars and a constant uh, um, number of bioinformaticians and an exponentially growing amount of data, so we have to think about, you know, how, what do we do in that situation? And that's pretty much what this talk is about. And uh, the way I think of this is, you know, the 10,000 sample uh, was, just, uh, was just completed. Shortly we'll have, you know, the analysis of roughly 10,000 genomes. We, we have other large projects like ICGC. And over the next few years, there are going to be a growing number of projects. So you could think of the sort of the problem, if we had a million genomes, you know, at about um, a terabyte for a, a, a match pair of, uh, of a tumor in a normal, that's a, a million terabytes or a thousand petabytes or about an exabyte. So that's a lot of data. We can compress it. It's still a lot of data. It costs a lot of money. Um, might, you might think of it as 100 studies with 10,000 patients each, each about the same size of the TCGA. How do we organize um, the data management, the data analysis, and the collaborative analysis of something like a million genomes? Um, I may run out of time at the end, so I really want to um, uh, thank my co uh, colleagues and collaborators, especially Kevin White, who I worked out, uh, we worked out a lot of these ideas together, um, and um, Nancy Cox, Andre Rizeski, Lincoln Stein, Barbara Stranger, you know, a lot of what I'm going to say is, is um, reflects joint work with, with these individuals. Um, these are my lab. I especially want to thank Allison Heath, who's the lead of the, um, of the BioNimbus Protected Data Cloud, and some key people from the White Lab who helped. And I want to talk about this disruption of big data, that big data is causing biomedical computing. So um, this is, I think, a, a standard slide I creatively borrowed from the NCI. Um, this is what you might think of as a, a, of the current model of biomedical computing. We, um, the bioinformatician, there's an artist, artist rendition of a biomathematician on the lower right-hand corner. Um, he or she has a private local computer downloads data, creates local data about, uh, you know, for about $1,000, uh, 
um, uses community software and everything is fine except if you, know, if you think of the $100,000 it might cost to analyze a genome, there's a bit of mismatch in terms of how easily we can create it and um, um, how much it costs to analyze it, how long it takes to analyze it, and as the amount of data grows, you can't use this model anymore. So the first problem is the growth of data. It can take weeks just to download a couple petabytes of data. Uh, the second issue is the growing types of data we have. Um, if we want to understand environmental impact at scale, and I'm going to talk a few years out, uh, then we need geospatial data at scale. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about other ways we might capture um, individual patient data and uh, um, environmental data. You can, w there'll be various devices uh, you might wear. Um, the, there's image data, so we have new types of data. We have this mismatch between the um, uh, ratio of data to sort of the bioinformatics required uh, to analyze it. And so um, things are pretty fundamentally broken. I just want to dive down to one of the areas. I don't have to talk here about the, uh, you know, how big the genomics data is. Uh, I want you to think ahead a couple years. Um, I heard a sort of an interesting talk recently, which is the sensors that are going, that are going to go into phones. And um, this is just one example from LifeWatch. But over the next few years, um, phones will have, um, right now, um, they have a lot of sensors. You, you know, you may or may not be aware of them, but they have a lot of sensors. That's how they can sense where you are, what your acceleration is, et cetera. They're going to add sensors to get environmental data like temperature, pressure, humidity, and um, they can add sensors and they will be adding sensors to do biometrics, first for security, but once they have that, you can do things. Here's a simple example where a phone will give you blood glucose, blood saturation, and heart rate, and um, infer stress. So over the next few years, there's going to be a lot of data coming from devices, and that's just one of the modalities that will eventually give us the environmental data. So if we think over the next five years, um, there's, we're going to be over, we're going to have a lot of new types of data. So um, the standard, um, this is a, a, you know, my wife told me I needed a hobby, and I, my hobby, as many of you know, is collecting pictures of data centers. And so this is um, a picture of a Google data center. Luckily, Google has um, made a lot of their data centers public, and you could drive through them. So whenever I have trouble sleeping at night, I like sort of um, driving through virtually the Google data center until I fall asleep. Um, I recommend it if you, you know, sometimes when you travel, you know, raise your hand if you have trouble sleeping when you travel, anyone? Yeah, just, you know, take a tour of a Google data center. It's kind of interesting. It will help you get back to sleep. So why, why do I talk about a Google data center? So um, it's, it, it's from the next slide. Um, I spent a little bit of time um, b um, as a consultant building computational advertising. And why is computational advertising interesting? Um, so first of all, what is it? Um, it's, it finds the best match between a user in a given context, like searching or walking in a given area, and um, something that really might make them happy. You know, what makes people happy? Well, good health and seeing nice advertisements. And why is this relevant? Well, it's relevant because it's a $100 billion industry, and, um, every, you know, and if you do it right, you make an extra billion dollars. If we do cancer right, we save a lot of lives, but we don't make an extra billion dollars. And so there's a cycle in computational advertising that leads to innovation of data analysis that we don't have in our field. We might save money, we might improve health, but we can't mint money by building better data infrastructure or by building data analysis. We can borrow what those people build. Just to give you an example, um, you know, a modern advertising platform will build full behavioral models, statistical models over 100 million or more individuals. Um, they will reanalyze the data each night. They will reanalyze all of the data, every single bit of data in a data center they can reanalyze. They'll serve tens of thousands of ads per second. They'll do it in milliseconds. They'll use exactly where you are geospatially. 
They'll do it at machine speed with fewer people than we use in bioinformatics, and they do it with people who have a lot less training. So, um, it, you know, it's, it's, there's probably something to be learned from this. And so, you know, one of the standard solutions to the problem I just described of the growing um, uh, growth of genomic, environmental, and um, other types of data is to sort of borrow that technology uh, create a similar type of technology where instead of asking every individual to download and work locally with terabytes and soon petabytes of data, you do it in um, a commons. Everyone shares in that commons. We try to make the experience as close to as what they would get to locally. You know, and uh, you know, for the bioinformaticians, you know, there there was a when you first did mail. Um, in the cloud with Google or Yahoo, you didn't think it would work, but shortly it works, and now most of us do it. So that's probably the transition we'll see when you have to analyze these large terabyte to petabyte scale data sets. At the beginning, it will be awkward, it'll be painful. Um, for those of us working with us now, it may be very painful, but it will eventually get better. And there's, you know, in the end, it's, it will be as seamless as we now analyze, we now do mail. Um, we will also interoperate with private, with private storage and compute at medical research centers and universities. And the, the point of this talk is how do we structure all of this in a way that, that should work as seamlessly as possible. So I just want to um, remind you of the terminology. Why do we call it a commons? Well, Garrett Hardin, um, wrote an interesting science paper in 1968 called The Tragedy of the Commons. The term commons uh, has been used in economics for something like a cow pasture in a village. So if you have a village, there's a pasture, and if everyone sort of um, thinks, keeps the village in mind, then the, all the cows can sort of share in the pasture and it's available to everyone. If there are some um, individuals with cows that take more than their share, then there's not enough common pasture for the village and, uh, the whole, and everyone suffers. And that's where we are more or less in bioinformatics today. We can't afford everyone to have their local petabyte cache of genomics data. Uh, we have to build some commons and figure out the most transparent way to share that. If we don't do it right, uh, Garrett Hardin introduced the tragedy of the commons. So a lot of this talk you could think of as how do we stay away from the tragedy of the commons as we build large biomedical commons. So the, the standard story that we're trying to work out is you would use these, these large structures to create a community of biomedical data. There would be a number of them. They would interoperate and you would compute over it. I want to put this into perspective into sort of three eras of bioinformatics. And each of them is, is about 10 years long. And we're just leaving what, what I think of as the first error. And the first error was sort of the, 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 the it, it started in 1999 with the Bodstein and Smarr report for, that created BISD. Um, it was really about the integration of informatics tools and how we could do that at scale. And whenever you do things at scale in computing and with data, it's easier to get it wrong than to get it right. And we're just, uh, you know, I, I think we've just emerged from this era. Um, there was a new report, if you, the, um, the uh, Data and Informatics Working Group by Demetz and Tabak did a 19, 2012 report on big data, and I sort of want to come to that and how we get there. Um, and there's been a, um, different types of um, assessments of what we did in that first era. But as we sort of think into the future, I think it's good to sort of think of this, you know, almost 30-year context of how do we do bioinformatics at scale and how do we do it right. So I'm going to come back to fill in this chart. So um, in most talks, you can only learn one thing and then you stop paying attention. Um, I can't tell you anything about cancer because I really don't know anything about cancer. I can tell you a little bit about computing. The only thing I want you to take away from this talk is I want you to stop, to use, stop using the word cloud computing. Why should you stop using the word cloud computing? Well, by the time 
you can't go to an airport and see the word cloud computing, there's probably no meaning in the word cloud computing anymore. And so, uh, at least when I go to airports, you know, if, if I didn't have a family to support, I would probably remove all signs I see about cloud computing because I think it's sending the wrong message. But at this point in my life, I don't want to be arrested for vandalism. So I want to give you a better way to think about this. And this is, again, a picture of a Google uh, data center. This is the mechanical, the power, the cooling, and so on. And um, if, if, if there's one thing you take away is, you know, you should try to get into a Google data center. Um, you know, if you're malicious, you could, if you're mis mischievous, you could sort of try to paint um, different colors on some of the pipes. But it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. So the, the first question, I, you know, I just want to ask, you know, we know that for small objects we use microscopes and for far objects we use telescopes, what would a data scope look like? And um, Barrasso and Holsey um, um, wrote a first edition, this is the second edition, and the key thing is the, you know, a data scope is probably a data center. And we need to learn how to engineize data centers that will scale with the bioinformatics software we need. So really, the, you know, you, we don't really, we don't care about cloud computing. We do care about how we could build boutique data centers for our community that will allow us to do the bioinformatics we need. And how do we do that with a modest number of people? And how do we do it so the software scales and is easy to use? And how do we do it so that there could be a number of them that interoperate at scale? And uh, you know, the data center as a computer is really what's relevant for our community. So forget about cloud computing. Think about data centers. Um, modern data centers have the ability that you can go to a portal and self-provision a cluster with 100 nodes, do a computation, do it, you know, wake up in the middle of the night, get a portal, do a bioinformatics computation, and tear down that port uh, and tear down those hundred machines, and you know, have the, the the gist of some analysis that you can sort of use the next day. So you have scale. The only way this could be done is if the data center uses massive automation, and the only way it it works um, for our community is if the software scales to the entire data center. And so the main difference between databases, you know, people get very well known in this audience, but the people I hang out with get very emotional about the design of databases. There's, you know, traditional relational databases. There's what's called NoSQL databases. There's um, not only SQL databases. Uh, and there are just a couple simple rules about databases. Databases, like all software, takes about 10 years to get it right. And um, the, the main reason that databases weren't, uh, you know, are no longer used um, for some of these problems in advertising is databases don't scale until very recently to a data center. They scale to a rack or a portion of a rack. They don't scale to hundreds of racks. And so the types of uh, databases we need are the types that will scale to large number of racks in a data center. So if, if, you, if you read the NIST report that gives a definition of a, of a cloud, you can have a cloud that looks like something on the left. You could have someone who operates a cloud that looks like the bioinformatician on the right, because from their point of view, all that matters is it runs OpenStack or some other software and has a certain, um, uh, you know, um, certain characteristics that aren't important here. But the difference is we can't do what we need with. Um, uh, this is. A, I'm not going to embarrass anyone, but um, does anyone reckon? I don't think the person's in the audience. This is a real live data center at a university that does really top-rate science that is regularly published in Science and Nature. Um, but that's their data center. And look at this data center compared to this. Um, there's a big difference. So, um, you know, we have to get to this. So this is um, a sort of a schematic of what you need. You need to do accounting and billing, you need to do monitoring, you need to do provisioning. If you do this right, you could sort of do hundreds of petabytes, which is pretty much close to what we need to do our x byte of analysis. And so this is a commercial data center. It's run by about 25 people. They measure computing in megawatts. And the question you know, that I want to pose to this audience 
is um, just, just nothing to keep us from building these things for our community. The real question is who should build them, how they should operate, and you know how do we best do bioinformatics with them. And there's a lot of open source software out there um, to do that. For the first time, Facebook decided to describe how they build their data centers. Um, people have not done this very, very often, and there's something called open compute. So if, you know, Facebook will spend a couple hundred million dollars on a data center, and most of us can't spend that much money, but they've open sourced how they do that in a project called open compute. So if we want to build a downsized data center, we can do that. And this is a picture of a, you know, of a 30 megawatt Facebook data center, but the blueprints are out there. So there's nothing to keep our community from doing this and from interoperating with others. And I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna talk very much at all about our work, but what we did is we took the standard blueprints for a commercial data center, scaled it down dramatically so we could build it, and then used open source software whenever we could, and then built the smallest amount of glue software, and that there was a in, in, in for automation software we built, some compliance software, and some billing. But we built the smallest amount of glue software. We tried to we used open source for almost all of it because we know that you can only build a little sophomore. It takes 10 years, and you get it wrong the first three times. Um, so luckily, we've been doing this almost 10 years now. Um, we bet on two, three things. OpenStack, Hadoop, and Gluster. Two of them worked out well. One of them didn't. I won't mention which one, but um, this week, uh, the, the last couple weeks and the next few weeks, we're transitioning to a data center um, infrastructure with the two that did work. So uh, the, I think the, the standard question is, why not just use commercial data centers? Um, you know, if you go through airports, and you, you see signs from Microsoft and Rackspace and all these commercial data centers, um, it's, and you know, it's, it, it's, they're certainly gonna be part of the solution. The question in front of us is, are they the only part of the solution? They, they scale, they work as long as you have a credit card, and they give you a lot of choices. I think that the reason that we shouldn't is um, um, we should, build our own in addition to operating with the commercial ones is at medium scale cost less. So cost can be very important. Um, you know, if you're a CIO, you probably know the number, but it's probably 3x or more, uh, three to 5x less expensive to build your own. Um, we can build specialized infrastructure we need for bioinformatics. We can build specialized infrastructure we need for compliance and security. And the data is probably too important to be trusted exclusively with commercial ones. But then the question is, um, it's probably the, 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 the question we have to do from a, how do we build these. If we have, say, you, let's say you've, you've done your NIH grant, uh, you've gotten samples, you've sequenced them, you've analyzed them, and you've put them in some cloud, you should have you know, what you might think of as a green button. Um, has anyone used a blue button to get your medical records? Okay, so there's a, a, a process that uh, HSH is doing where um, there's a blue button, and if you hit the blue button, you can get your medical records. I think the way our community should work is we should, anytime we do anything, we should have a green button. And if you hit the green button, your terabytes or petabytes of data should be moved to another data center that you like better so that you control where your data goes. You know, it has to be done securely, compliantly. It has to be done with the simple apparatus that we have with dbGaP or whatever replaces it. But, you know, you should have a green button. And whenever you hit that green button, you should be able to liberate your data so that you can move it around. And if we do that, you know, it's a, it's a pretty safe way way to interoperate with these, with these data centers. Um, this is um, in, under our cost. The green button is a large provider of uh, services, and the, uh, uh, the green line is a large provider of, uh, it's the largest provider of uh, computing infrastructure. The, the pink line below it is our cost for adding a petabyte of data. So at the beginning, you know, if you're less than half a petabyte, 
it's much, much, much less expensive to use a commercial si uh, provider. But as the number of petabytes grows, the gap between your cost and the cost of the, um, uh, of the commercial providers is, is very large. This is assuming you're operating at say 10 to 20 petabytes. If you operate much smaller, the slopes are different. But if you operate around 10 petabytes, there's a big difference. So that's one of the reasons. Um, I'm going to run out of time. There's, it, it, it's hard to do this, um, but one of the, one of the uh, tests you can use is if you build this right and you're doing, say, an alignment or you're doing variant calling and you double the amount of data, then you should be able to double the amount of racks and nothing should change. The software shouldn't change, the analysis shouldn't change, the accounting shouldn't change, nothing should change, but you should be able to do the varying calling in exactly the same amount of time with twice as much data. So I call this the rack test, and almost no infrastructure we build today has that. So typically if we double the amount of racks, we have to you know, go through a process of months to even longer to change the software, change how we provision, change the standard operating procedures. But what we should get to that if we double the amount of racks, we can do double the amount of data in the same amount of time. So that's, that, I call that the rack test, and it's the sort of the architectural principle to build these. So um, I, I want to fill in the next line of this. Uh, what, I, what I think of, as we now know how to do, but we don't know how to do very well, but we should get better at it over the next five to 10 years, is what you might call data center scale science. So we have examples. I mentioned the one we're working on, BioNimbus. There's CG Hub, which is one, probably one of the best examples of genomics at this scale. There's the Cancer Collaboratory that Lincoln Stein is doing. You know, CG Hub is what David Hausler and his collaborators are doing. Genome Bridge. Um, that Gaddy and others are doing. So over the next few years, um, there are companies like DNA Nexus, we're going to understand how to do data center scale science. Um, and we have to have these interoperate, and there's a lot of details to get right. But I want to now talk about, uh, and I think uh, this is some of the things that weren't always talked about in the, in the, in the, um, in the, in the big data NIH report, but it's, I think, some of the things we got to get right. Um, I want to talk very, very briefly about whether or not our discipline is the same or different than the other large science disciplines. And if this were a general science audience, uh, the people who work on the LSST in astronomy or the HAP uh, or the LHC in, in physics would get upset with me and, and sort of confront me at the end of the talk. Just so I know whether I have to go out the back door quickly, do we have anyone who works with the LSST or the LHC? Okay, the reason they get upset is these are the official numbers and um, they say they always have more data. Well, everyone has more data, but these are the official numbers. And um, there's a couple important differences. One these communities have 10 years to get something right, and by Moore's law, over 10 years, anything gets easy. Um, and the other thing is they're not doing that much data. They're doing a scary amount of data, 15, 20, 12 petabytes of original data, and you might get 10 times that much, but it's a manageable amount of data. Now, let's look at our community. Um, I, I, I wasn't able to get the exact numbers, but all I've known, I've been in this business about eight years, and every three to four years, we radically change the instruments we have. The cost of an instrument fully loaded with people and things like this is closer to a million dollars. We don't have one $10 billion instrument. We got thousands or tens of thousands of million dollar instruments. There is no business value in the physics data or the astronomy data. There is business value in the data we produce, so people are always not well behaved about sharing it. Um, the physicists and recently the astronomers um, have, uh, have a culture what I think of as big data friendly. Um, I'm trying to say this in a nice way, 
but you know, many of my colleagues, I won't mention who they are, will spend 10 to 15 years refining an ontology. It's not that that's not an important thing to do, is it doesn't scale. And so one of the lessons people have learned, and I'm gonna come back to this, is there's a trade-off in um, how, we, as the amount of data scales, of how we, how we automate and how we, you could make up, you could basically have to replace manual process with automated processes at scale, and we, we haven't been through that. And then the compliance is quite different. So, I, you know, I would say that you f can focus on what's at the bottom. In aggregate, we have more data, but at the top, the, there's common computing storage and transport, and our community is by and large afraid to use it. Um, I'll come back to that, but there's no reason we can't, yet the, 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 the security compliance um, sharing and uh, collaboration are quite different, as is the distributed nature. So we have an intrinsically distributed source of data. The physicists and astronomers analyze in a distributed fashion, but we produce and analyze in a distributed fashion. I don't want to go over this slide. This is a standard slide. I just wanted one slide. Why can't we borrow from um, other communities? This is a slide. If you, there's an open source, there's a lot of open source software for transport. If you pull it out, it doesn't work very, very well. Um, but if you pull it out and change a few parameters, this is a 10 gigabit se per second connection between the US and Europe. Um, and um, you pull, and I'm, I'm moving um, um, uh, some, ge um, some thousand genome data across the Atlantic, and it starts out at 1.6 gigabits per second. I change the buffers, it goes to 3.3. Um, I, I do a flag, so I pin to the right core, it goes to 3.7. I do that on the other side, it goes to 4.6. I put some flags on for processor infinity on both sides, it goes to 6.7. So I've taken um, a, a, a terabyte of data from 85 minutes to 20 minutes with a little bit of tuning all with open source software with a single flow, and I can run multiple flows. So physics, you know, this, this uh, UDT is used by the physics community, by the astronomers. Um, there's a lot of technology out there that's simple to use. Um, th but I, I wanna get back to, there's a lot the same and different. Um, we need to interoperate with commercial cloud service providers. There's a different infrastructure, um, but fundamentally, we need our green button to move data out. And there's a danger if we rely exclusively on commercial infrastructure and don't interoperate that we will implicitly not have the green buttons. Not because, um, not because our, you know, our heart's in the wrong place, but if, for those of you who have built software in Amazon, you tend to use a lot of Amazon-specific infrastructure, and even though it's supposed to be open source, most people's experience are, if you build exclusively to Amazon, you can't get the software out, even if it's open source. And this is true for a lot of the software we use in our community. So I, I think this lock-in and green button is essential. It's really about interoperability at scale. So the, the key question I've already said is not whether we're gonna use commercial cloud providers, but will we as a community figure out how to do it on our own? We, we, in, high energy, in, in high performance computing, you know, the community spends a lot on a, a few very large and a number of smaller uh, high performance computing. We have not done that in large data, and the critical question over the next couple years is will we do that as a community so that we understand how to do this? It has to be a different model than in advertising because we don't generate money, but we generate science and we improve health, so we do have to figure it out. Um, I've, I, um, the, you know, I've, I've learned about this business by building something called the Open Science Data Cloud, we, we have satellite data, environmental data, social science data, it's about a petabyte of open access data, about uh, a petabyte growing to several petabytes of controlled access data. It's done through a not-for-profit. So it's, you can do this, it takes time, and you know, most things in software take a few starts and take five to seven years to get right. I wanna talk a little bit about how you might analyze data at the scale of a data center, because I, I think this is really what's gonna be interesting over the next few years. 
So I, I keep coming back to this metaphor. It may seem like um, a silly metaphor, but um, in 1609, the, you know, the, the telescope only got you a 30x resolution improvement. The microscope in 1670, about 250x. You know, simulation science was born out of a cray and devices like that that got you between 10 and 100x. Um, and experimental science, you know, um, out of the instruments like the telescope or the microscope. So uh, the, the, the sort of what fascinates me and what I'm going to work on for the next 10 years is we, we're sort of at a simple place. Either we're not as smart as the people who did experimental science and simulation science, and we're not going to create a new science, um, or else, you know, because the, the resolution that we're going to get from computing at the scale of a data center is at the pessimistic a, a, and two, 10 to 100 size larger. At the optimistic end, it's probably 1,000 times larger. So if I give you an instrument, if I give um, your postdocs and your um, colleagues an instrument that has 1,000 times more resolution power, and you can't make new discoveries that no one else has done, then you're probably in the wrong business. I mean, at least that's how I'm looking at it. So, you know, as we build these instruments at scale, there's probably something new that's coming out not doing the same things that we have been doing at a larger scale, but something new. And to me, that's what's really exciting as we look at this data. So um, the best articulation of this um, I've seen, and this you can go to YouTube and listen to this. It's about an hour talk. Um, uh, Phil Anderson, a Nobel Prize winning scientist, gave a talk at Northwestern several years ago for about an hour. And he asked the question in his field, solid state physics, you know, as things increase in scale, um, did something, did generally new phenomena happen, or did the same phenomena happen, just more of it? And it, he gives this fascinating lecture um, where saying that more really is different in solid state physics where phenomena happen at the statistical level with spins and symmetry breakings that weren't present in any other scale. And he sort of gives a retrospection, retrospective analysis in his life of all the new things that happen at scale. And so as we build these, da you know, these data center scale computing, fill it with genomic, environmental, and self-tracking data, you know, we have an instrument that's 100 to 1,000 times larger, so I think the fundamental question is what new happens? And this is, there is a sort of a debate in, um, in, in language translation. Does, does it, has anyone worked in language translation? Okay. So, you know, DARPA took this view for many years that the way to get smarter with language translation was to put more money into it and build more complex models. And I simplified that, but they spent hundreds of millions of dollars and they built very complex models. Um, and um, Google, in a very quiet way, built extremely simple Bayesian models, but they did it with the data on the internet. And they, you know, they did it at scale. And, you know, a few years ago, I think it was very controversial, but right now, most people in statistical language, in, in language translation would say we're better off with simple models at scale that get smarter with more data than we are with more complex models at small data, at small scale. So the way I think of this, you know, if, if you're in the data center basis, you talk a, a business, you talk about watts, kilowatts, and megawatts. If you're in the disk business, you talk about gigabytes, terabytes, and petabytes. But if you're in the statistical business, you got to think about how do we build these large-scale models that work when I fill a data center full of, of data. Um, I've shown this slide a couple times. I love this slide. Let me describe it very briefly. Um, uh, some, some scientists took the standard methodologies we use to analyze functional MRI, and they abstracted that and tried it out. And they took um, a salmon, and, and the salmon was dead, so the salmon was not hurt for this experiment. They put the salmon in an fMRI, 
and they showed the salmon two sets of pictures um, with a really good experimental design. One set of pictures had humans with angry emotions, and one set of pictures had humans with uh, happy with positive emotions. And they identified using the methodology that was standard in their field, which voxels lit up when the dead salmon was shown pictures of happy humans. And um, they um, got, you know, put it, for some reason the, um, the first conference they set it to rejected the poster, but they, uh, they eventually got this thing published and you can sort of um, Google on it and um, so th th that voxel is the voxel that a dead salmon uses to identify happy humans. And um, I think, you know, this is the, the as you get more data, uh, there's really nothing to keep you from being stupid. In fact, the more data you have, the easier it is to be stupid. Um, but, you know, that's no reason not to analyze big data. And there's going to be a backlash, you know, um, there was a lot of talk about you know, search terms, you can uh, be able to predict flu. It was a first generation and, you know, the models weren't great. They're good for PR, but not good for predicting flu. But that doesn't mean that the models won't get better over time. So there's going to be a backlash. Um, but, you know, one of the things I'm enjoying doing is taking massive amounts of environmental data, massive amounts of me medical records, overlaying over genomic data with my colleagues and seeing what we can build that we haven't been able to build before. There's nothing to keep us stupid, and we may in the end be stupid, but there are going to be people out there who are going to figure out how to build these models. Um, the, the world's simplest classifier, I've spent about 20 years of my life building these, are decision trees. Uh, they're very simple to build, so you could ask, you know, when uh, clusters, when Baywolf clusters came out, uh, you built a bunch of decision trees and you combined them in an ensemble. And at the beginning, the statisticians, I got heckled for a couple years talking about ensembles, but now, you know, high school kids build ensembles of models. Um, but the question is, what does that look like at the scale of a data center? And so we and others have done simple experiments when you could say, what replaces an ensemble? Ensembles at the typical scale of a data center don't scale very well because they tend to overfit. Uh, because, you'll, if, you know, if I have um, 100,000 machines and build 100 models on each machine, you know, that's a lot of millions of, of classifiers. But you can build, sort of use randomization to send skeleton classifiers out and just train them. So there's, there are ways to scale. I don't want to talk about it here, but I think that's what's going to be exciting. And, you know, the question, you know, you know in the important fields like advertising, you analyze all the data each night. In fields that we're in, like cancer genomics and healthcare, we don't analyze the data each night. But, you know, with the right infrastructure, you could simply ask what could we do to impact the field if we could do that. So the, the, the um, you know, the, the age I think we're about to do in bioinformatics is, you know, we're about to be able to ask the question, is more different at the scale of a data center when it's folded with genomics, environmental, um, uh, and phenotype data? And I don't think we know the answer. You know, I think it's a really, it's a wonderful time to be entering the field, um, but that's really the challenge in front of us is how do, do we do the modeling at scale and how do we do validation at scale? So I have the, I have a, couple of rules I use when I build statistical models, and one of them is you, you can't do data analysis at scale unless you have an automated testing and validation environment. So uh, it's really about how do we validate these models that we build at scale. I want to end, um, end this talk uh, quickly. There are a lot of clouds out there from um, DNA Nexus to the Cancer Genome Collaboratively to the CG Hub. And um, I want to just, sh it's for those of you, I just want to make this very concrete. I'm going to, um, uh, this is the only slide I'll, I'll do about some of the things we've done. But the traditional way to analyze, you know, uh, 100 terabytes of data uh, was to hire staff, set up the infrastructure, get your environment improved, um, have fights with your security and compliance people, hire the bioinformaticians, set up the pipelines, download the data, begin analysis, 
And you know, this is not something that scales because of costs, because the fact there are not enough bioinformaticians, because the fact that there are just not enough people to do this. And so what we and others have done is you could now log on to uh, certain of these uh, computing infrastructures, use your existing NIH grant credentials, it will check to see what you have dbGaP access to and begin your analysis immediately. So something that took a year can now be done in more or less instantaneously. So the real question is, what is the scale of this? How do we interoperate this? Um, and how do we build the models over this? And so I, I, at the, la the last slide, uh, the last uh, five minutes, I really talk about how we how I, we organize. And I like this model that worked in networking, and I think most of you heard me talk about this before. It was called the condo model. And the reason we have in the research community 10 and 100 gigabit per second networks is because we don't buy them from commercial carriers. What we do is universities and research centers get together and they lay their own dark fiber and they've been doing this for 10 years, and it changed the way we did scientific research. And you think of these as cyber condos. And these cyber condos interoperate with the commercial carriers, the commercial ISPs, but it's the reason we just did an experiment where we had a 100 gigabit connection between um, one of our facilities and NCBI, and we did BAM slicing at scale over a 100 gigabit pipe. We wouldn't be able to do that if we bought that infrastructure from the um, commercial internet service providers. So you could think of genomics cloud condos where groups get together, they build these data centers at scale, they interoperate and, and they, with each other and they interoperate with the, uh, can one of the, oh, okay, thank you. Um, and so I think um, this, is, this is what we have to do. Um, and we're doing one in the Chicago region called the Burnham um, uh, Science Cloud. And if you're doing one in your region, I really would like to talk to you because I think this is what's going to happen over the next couple of years. So over the next few years, um, we got to learn how, um, how to interoperate. The way the internet took off is the large internet service providers peer, that is they share data without cost. And that's what I hope will happen with our commons. What we'll do is if you're a researcher in Europe, you should be able to, um, um, you know, uh, log on to whatever you're doing, and we should be able to interoperate with EBI and those others. So it shouldn't matter whether the data is in EBI or in our cloud or in the Cancer Collaboratory or in CG Hub, that there'll be transparent interoperability with no cost between the large commons providers. And we just need standards to be able to do that. If you do the standards ahead of building it, you're gonna fail miserably. And um, that's, you know, th these are what we will be working on over the next few years. So I just wanna recap. Um, so we have about 10 minutes for questions. Where we are right now is, um, you know, we can build an infrastructure for roughly 10,000 patients. We can't interoperate that with other infrastructures. Um, and what we'll need to be able to figure out over the next few years is how to scale that up by a factor of 10 to 100 and how to interoperate and how to do the governance and how to do sustainability. And we're, you know, as uh, from my point of view, the the challenge is really um, not in the data center scale science. I, I think we more or less know how to do that. We just got to get it. We just got to do it. The intellectual challenge is in how do we analyze and model data at scale and bring in other orthogonal data types at scale that we've never been able to do before. So. I think it's perfectly feasible. Everyone has a smartphone. Very shortly, the smartphones are gonna have a lot of sensors, and there's going to be a lot of data that we can bring in, and we can't align it perfectly. That is, we're not gonna be in the, in the position, I think, for a long time because of, 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 of consent 
that the data we collect environmentally, the data we collect from phenotype information from medical records will be aligned. That is, we won't have one key that will point to a genome, a phenotype, and an environment. But at scale, there are only two things that happen. Either the devil's in charge of data management, in which the data comes to us in such a way that in the asymptotic limit, nothing aligns, or else as we get more data, even though we don't know exactly how it lines, we could do statistical inference and take models. You know, if I have a billion medical records, I cover a lot of people, and if I have 10 million genomes, I should be able to statistically figure that out. So um, that's, that's why I'm excited about the future. Um, we have between one, we have at least one minute for questions, right? More than one. Okay, we have more than one minute for questions, but um, if I can make one um, uh, request, if you are interested in any of the things I talked about, come see me sometime during this conference. Thank you. So, questions for Dr. Grossman? And please come up to the mic. Hi. Um, do you think, so, so with the advertisement model uh, for large data computing you mentioned, uh, the methods are fairly consistent and one company usually um, owns the method that operates on all the data. The important thing uh, with bioinformatics analysis is a lot of times iteration on the methods. Um, and that can be hard to do because when you think about writing methods for distributed computing, you have to write them carefully so they work on a distributed network. Do you think this type of common approach would support fast iteration of methods and how do you kind of manage um, new approaches and new data analyses uh, methods as they come up? So I think is the question that there's less, iter the, is the question that you th there may be less iteration in, in computational advertising? Um, there's less interested parties in what the right algorithm should be, perhaps. That's, that's uh, wrong. <laughs> Whereas yeah. um, in, a, in a research environment, there's certainly a lot of opinions on what the right algorithm is to use. I, I, uh, yeah, I, th I think there's just, it's a different trade off space. You know, in computational advertising, there's a lot of money at stake, and people have strong, strong opinions whether right or wrong. Um, I, 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 you know, I think there's similarities and differences. Um, but, you know, I think we can steal certain techniques from them, and they probably will steal certain techniques from us. Um, we'll probably acknowledge it, and they probably won't. But, um, you know, I, I, I think there's a little bit to learn, not a lot. Sorry for not giving you a more satisfactory answer. Yeah. Yep. Uh, in the bioinf uh, bioinformatics uh, space, the nature of the data is very com uh, complexity, and there are things which have not in, in, uh, even started, like imaging histology data, you know, of millions of patients, extracting feature from them, integrating with the <laughs> clinical. So what is your opinion on what is the state of, you know, algorithm scalability where you consider different aspects of data apart from the, you know, genome, genome sequencing? I, I think you're right, um, but, you know, if you look at the problem of statistical language translation, and you look at the progress we've done in statistical language translation by using relatively simple models over data, if you look at the progress we've done in image recognition at scale with internet scale data, where you can fairly easily recognize faces, if you look at the way we're geotagging data and taking synthesis of data that's been gathered on the web to create mosaics, um, there is absolutely no question about the complexity of, bio, of say, genomic data and some of the other data around it. But um, I, I'm, I'm sort of, um, think I'm in a relatively optimistic question because, uh, position, because I think we're in a relatively, should be relatively optimistic just because of problems which were formerly intractable like language translation, image recognition, we can do with relatively simple techniques at scale. So one of the, you know, hopefully it will appear, uh, I worked with Andre Rozeski and a few others, and we asked the question, if you could double the complexity of the model, and we define that, or double the amount of data, and we define that, 
would you be better off in terms of standard metrics on improving the model by doubling the, mo by doubling the complexity of the model in, in, in a good information theory way or doubling the amount of data? And there are different regimes for different problems, but most of the time you're better off over large regimes of just doubling the data. And so um, I, 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 there's clearly biomedical data is extremely complex, but I think we, we'll be in a position where we can make some discoveries that we wouldn't have imagined a few years ago. So Thank we've you. got more questions. I think there's a lot more room for discussion, but we're at, at 9.59 and we've got a, a tight schedule. So Dr. Grossman, thank you again very, very much. And um, uh, John Weinstein uh, from MD Anderson was originally scheduled to um, uh, chair the session. Uh, unfortunately, um, he's had a, a, a small, a minor uh, a medical issue that's prevented him from traveling. Uh, and uh, his colleague, Dr. Han Liang, has graciously uh, agreed to chair in his place. Uh, Dr. Liang, thank you.